not animated. No. <laughs> what is going on, folks and folk around All five of you that's in there right now, which I'm pretty sure is going to pick up here in a little bit. But anywho, hopefully y'all all are doing good tonight. Hopefully. What is the deal? What is the dealio? Dealio, dealio. No. Oh, boy. What's going on, cowgirl Christian? Before I get into my nightly lecture. Because I have some interesting, very interesting stuff that happened. Conversations. How y'all doing? How are y'all doing? You guys all see the title, right? You guys all see the title. So, um, what, uh, Christian, cowgirl Christian, do you have my email? How are you guys doing from England, from New York City? How are you guys all doing? Christian Cowgirl. I mean, Cowgirl Christian, I'm sorry. Do you have my email? Cowboy Land USA. What's going on, movie reviews and Tory Ross? I want you to email me because I'm getting ready to get into I'm getting ready to get into that very thing, that very same thing. And I don't know what it's going to do, but it really doesn't matter because um, it's just a conversation that I've had with uh, quite a few uh, co-workers friends and such. And uh, I'm pretty sure it's going to make some uh, folks upset like it did them or some conversations I had over the weekend. Zombie squad, I got you. I remember. I, I got you. I answered you back. Okay. So anyway, you guys all here, I'm going to roll into it. You guys see that the name of this, the title of this is, uh, you know, playing the victim card and also the entitlement to feeling like somebody owes you something. So anyway, woo wee, you know, what's really getting interesting in this is that a lot of y'all, y'all being some, some people been sending me videos and asking me to respond to it. Like y'all saw how I responded to the news anchor when she said, Oh, kind of looks like you. So anyway, we passed that. Y'all already see what my ideas only. If not, you can go back and watch it. Now, what we end up getting into is this very thing here. Woo, people thought I was going to jump on a bandwagon. We had a discussion somewhere with some people who all pretty much this whole thing that came down to this, guys. And it was very cool is that this whole thing of we are oppressed. The man is keeping us down as black folks. We are. And I completely made folks mad. I said, who is doing that to you? Where has it happened? Or are you only saying that because you heard others say that? Show me. Can you take me to the person or the people who is keeping you down? That's what I want them to do. Everybody, I'm telling you, it was family members. It was friends of family members and friends of friends of family members. We got into this huge thing because the thing is, folks don't even know why they say some things that they say. And excuse me if I'm not able to see y'all comments because I'm looking directly in the camera. Otherwise, I have to keep on looking over here. What's going on, Nikki66? Everybody that's in here, I'm just saying hi to y'all already. But anyway, I'm trying to get into this whole topic thing like that. So that way, y'all can feel like y'all kind of interacting with me versus me just putting a video up and y'all got to sit there and just listen. You listen in anyway. But anyway, so here's the thing. the It made somebody mad because they thought that I was going to jump on this bandwagon. Oh, yeah, they keeping us down. Well, it's like, um, well, how did I get where I am? Can you answer me that? How did I get where I am? Because if the man or this hmm, is keeping us down, 
black people down or oppressed, then how did I get where I am? See, the thing is, it's like if you keep on feeding that mentality into people, younger generations, then their expectations is going to be just to always play this victim card and always play this card like somebody owes them something. That's one of the worst things they can do amongst people in communities like that is that if you play this card all the time, like somebody see, here's a problem. The reason why they feel like somebody owe them something is because somebody keeps on giving them something all the time. Never have to work for nothing. Never got to bust your butt for nothing. Never got to apply no logic to anything to get somewhere to get anything. But yet you sit back and the reason why I can't get it is because the system is I'm like so when the thing is, it made them so mad because I'm one of those people that no matter what, I always tell somebody who said that. Well, you know, they say, well, who is they and whoever they are? What makes them right? And nobody can give me no answer. Oh, man, you just tripping, man. You know, you know what I'm talking. No, I do not. really. I really don't know what you're talking about. I want to know who it is that you're talking about. Since you stand it with such a surety, I want to know who it is that's keeping you from reaching the goals of your dreams that you are trying to reach. Who is it? No matter what. And so anyway, uh, of course, I knew it was going to get on this kick where they uh, they start talking about, well, you know, you know, oh, my God, guys, y'all know how I am. I'm not into politics. I'm a freaking free thinker. I don't care what goes on in that world of what people try to press on you. But this whole thing, like, for instance, at, uh, at a job, they were saying how, well, you know, that uh, a white privilege exists. And I said, so let me ask you something. Where? <laughs> That's what I want to know, because. I said, I can go to a, a bunch of different cities and states. Well, I'm doing a lot better than white people. I can go to a state where there's white people doing better than me. But what are we talking when we say better? What are we talking about? Because if you're talking about financial wise and you define it as success, well, then you missed the whole point. Because if that's the case, there's some people that don't have the m- most financial economical status, but yet they're happy. But then there's people that actually have super crazy astronomical economics and they kill themselves. And I'm not trying to blast nobody on this, but for instance, people like, OK, Robin Williams, you know, he killed himself. He had all the money in the world, had fans all over the world, was a very funny guy. But then yet he was dealing with depression. So that's why I talk to people. See, what gets confused is who keep on putting these thoughts, these things in your mind that what success is, has everything to do with financial. To me, what success is, is everything I say at the end of all my videos, food, shelter, clothing and great health. To me, you have all those things. and They're all balanced out. and They're all good. That to me right there is success. So anyway, what uh, makes these people mad? I say, so what it is, is that somebody gave you a goal to shoot from and you didn't even ask if that's the goal that you actually want. Because guess what? Once you reach this so-called financial freedom, whatever like that, then what? So you just so you think you think that once you reach the financial freedom, you just all of a sudden going to be happy. Everything is going to be great. No, you still going to have issues you got to deal with. Whether you have money or not, you still dealing with the same issues. People that got money and people that don't have money still deal with depression, still deal with adultery, still deal with somebody stealing from them or somebody doing that. You still going to deal with death, money, whether you poor or broke. I mean, whether you broke, poor, middle class, upper class, no matter what it is, you're still going to deal with diseases, a cold, a flu. So it, you know what I'm saying. So these life circumstances doesn't pick you according to your financial status or according to your skin color. It hits you all the same. So now that I'm hitting them with this type of uh, logic, it makes them like, well, well, no, 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 no. See, that's what I'm saying. Who told you that? Who, who, who told you to think like that? Who came up with these concepts and all of a sudden you just jumped on the bandwagon? Yeah, they're keeping us down. Well, how? How? By doing what? What's keeping you down is the fact that if somebody keeps on doing something for you. So in other words, the example that I'll always love to give is this. Why do people say, and I want you guys to answer this. I know the comments are flying over here to the side, but um, why is it that when a, when your child, as they grow and they begin to walk a little bit, why do you keep telling people, stop picking my baby up? What's going to happen? What do y'all tell people that for? Like, hey, can you please stop picking up my child? Once your baby learns how to start walking, why do you tell them, hey, stop picking up my child so much? What's the reason why? I'm going to wait for you guys to answer if y'all listening. Got one answer. Got two. That's right. Here now they rolling in. Exactly, exactly. Y'all are hitting it on the head. Y'all know y'all are hitting it on the head. 
Absolutely, 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 absolutely. Everybody's giving great answers right there. Now, um, yes, that's right. That's right. That that's because if you keep on picking up that child, that child is never gonna walk all the way to the day, even though they can grow to be an adult. If you keep on picking them up and doing everything for them, they are never gonna learn to do on their own. That's the same. No, that's what I messed them up with. That's the same type of mentality that's being pushed into my skin color people and all kind of not just this, but predominantly, I'm just being real dominantly amongst the black community is that that's what's being done to them. And they don't even recognize it. I'm trying to get them to see that if somebody keeps on giving you stuff and doing stuff for you, you're not going to want to do it. And just like a baby, guess what's going to happen every time somebody puts you down? You're going to gonna sit there and whine and cry to cry until you get your way. And guess what? Usually they give in and give you what you want. They're going to give you more food stamp, give you a free phone, give you free housing. You're never going to have to do for yourself. But guess what? You're never going to walk. You're going to always remain a baby that's always reliant on somebody to pick you up and hold you. You're never going to be able to know what it feels like to be independent and walk. You're never going to feel like, guess what? Certain stages happen. After you learn to walk, you walk faster. Then you learn to run a little bit. Then you learn to actually climb on something. So in other words, all these different skills and abilities that you could actually gain if you learn to do this stuff on your own, you don't get it because somebody's always picking you up and putting you on their hip and moving you around and rocking you until you stop crying and all that. But as soon as somebody puts you down and you wake up, eh, eh, you start crying. And what do people say? Don't pick that baby up. You keep on picking that baby up. You're going to spoil her. You're going to spoil him or her. You know, so that's exactly what I'm saying. So it's like you're trying to get these people just to get this concept out of their mind. You know, so you're thinking that you're doing something because you think that it's great because somebody keeps on giving you something and yet. Look where most likely look where you live in a lot. You live. Look at the areas that you live in. Look, look at look at the, the generational, pretty much the generational thing that's being pressed down. You are actually doing and living the same way that your great grandma did. Great. Then you're doing the same thing that your grandma did. The same thing that your mom did. Now you're doing it. And the same thing, your kids going to see what you're doing, how you're getting where you're getting, why you're doing what you're doing. And it's just going to keep on falling in. But you're not really trying to get on this board or this train where you're actually trying to push them to. Uh, Come on, like put them on their two feet. Come on, you can do it. You catch them sometimes, but you only giving them enough help just to keep them from hurting themselves. But yet you keep on pushing them to walk, right? That's what you do with kids. You put them down. Come on, you encourage them. You can do it. You can do it. And as soon as they by the fall, you will catch them. Okay, but you keep on trying until they get it, right? So that's what I try to tell folks. This is the type of thing that I try to do with them. I'm trying to put you on your two feet and tell you walk towards this way. Walk towards what a success is. Walk towards me. Keep on looking at me. And if you're getting ready to fall, I'm going to catch you. But I'm not just going to keep on, you know, doing it. Once you learn to walk on your own two feet, you got it. Now my next thing is now you're going to master walking. Once you master walking, now I'm going to show you how to run. Once you master running, now we're going to try to master what it's like to climb. Once you master climbing, now we're going to work on a little bit more things that's a little bit more involved, a little bit more things that's considered, you know, that, um, cause you to have a little bit more high level stuff. So now we're going to learn how to kick a ball, you know, you know, then we're going to learn how to do other things. So my point is that each step has its new learning skills, new learning abilities that you actually can learn. But we got to first start off with me picking you up, putting you on your two feet, letting you walk towards me and try to catch you when you're about to fall until you master that. Now we're going to move on. But what they're not doing and people act like they don't want to see it is they're keeping you there. They're keeping you there in that same predicament. Nothing's coming out of it, but then yet you will still sit back and talk about how they're keeping you down and how we are oppressed and all this stuff like that. And then what turns around is that folks will get mad because I'm like, I mean, they you just trying to be different. Look, I'm not oppressed. Most of the folks that I'm around, black black folks that actually have like a certain type of level of you know a, a, a certain type of skill in a job world, whether it's medical apprenticeships, you know, uh, uh, what do you call it? Like electricians, any of those carpenters, uh, mechanics, any of those people that learn to trade, you say something to them like, Hey man, do you feel the oppression of the, do you feel the oppression? Nick? What are you talking about? Cause there is none. There is not, I don't care what they say, what they tell you folks can get mad at me. There is no oppression. Everything I got is because I worked for it. And nobody shows nobody how to work. And that's the issue. Nobody's trying to go out there and show these kids and some of these single moms that's really, really young moms who pretty much are babies raising babies. Nobody's showing them actually what hard work means. See, because the thing is, 
they had it so easy that if you even mention the word hard, oh no, uh uh-uh, uh, uh uh, no, no. You know what? Sometimes I wish I can do to some of these kids and some of these uh, uh, young adults what I do to babies. See, with babies, all you do is you put them on their feet and you go, come on, come on. You don't give them no explanation. You don't, a baby can't understand it anyway. So a lot of times with these people, I'm like, just do what I'm telling you to do because you're not going to understand it. Just walk towards me. And if you're going to fall, I'm going to try to catch you, but I'm going to put you right back up on your feet. Come on, come on. Even babies cry, don't they? They'll cry while they're walking to you. They'll, <laughs> and once they make it, you like, yeah, you did it. And the baby kind of, you know, they look at you, then you make them do it again. So what the baby starts to learn is that, Hey, every time I go towards this, it seems like it makes him happy and everybody starts cheering for me. So in other words, they start to get a little bit of positive feedback for what they're doing, even though they're crying and they're scared because they think they're going to fall. They're nervous. They're shaking. The thing is that they notice that when they make it to the goal, which is you, once they get there, you encourage them. Everybody's happy. Everybody's joyful. Then you, okay, now do it again. Yay! Yay! And then you notice the baby will just start to, after some, I'm talking about like after weeks go by, once the baby learns to walk real good, they'll just look at you. And once you, once they make eye contact with you, they'll just start walking to you because they want that positive feedback. So my point is that with some folks, it's almost like I just want to like not talk to them. I just want to just go, come on, just come on. Come on, you can do it. Come on. And when they come to it, yay, now you master, now you've done that. Okay, let's do that again. Come on, come on. Because I don't want to explain to them why I'm doing it. Because the minute I say, well, like if you can't you can't say to a baby, come on, little baby. I know it's gonna be hard for you to walk. I know it's gonna be scary. I know you're gonna be nervous, but you can do it. So now it's like I learned something. I'm not gonna tell people, hey, it's gonna be hard, you're gonna be nervous, you're gonna be scared. All I'm gonna simply do is encourage them just to walk this way. Come here. Walk this way. Come on. Walk this way. Walk this way. Well, why do you want me to walk? Don't worry about it. Just come here. Come here. Walk this way. So that's what that's why I want to do this whole thing of uh, like, I mean, I love having conversations with family and friends and coworkers over stuff like this, because there's particular ones that I talk to. They know who they are. And I'm pretty sure they're watching is that they're like, I just never thought about it that way. You know, I never thought about that. I'm being kind of bamboo. That's my point. The very people you think are helping you are debilitating you in therapy. We progress patients to get it. It's, it's crazy. We progress patients the same way we kind of do babies. See, with, with babies, they don't know how to use a, a wheel walker. They don't know how to use a, you know, a uh, lost strand crutches or a platform walker or a hemi walker or a quad cane. See what we do with a lot of our patients as our patients get stronger. We advance them and we take away things that helps them a lot because the thing that helped them can actually be the very thing that can debilitate them. So I'll give you guys an example. Once our patients, whoever is a hip replacement, knee replacement, I don't care what type of injury they may have had to the lower extremities. What we do is we give them a walker because the walker is there to help them temporarily. Once we notice that they that using that walker is a little easy, guess what we do? We take the walker away. Now we're going to give you a hemi walker. It's super hard to use that Hemi walker, but it's building up the muscles that now have to work. Because guess what? If they still in that walker, only certain muscles are going to have to work to keep them there while other muscles are actually going to be weakened. So when we give them the Hemi walker, now the muscles that were possibly being weakened, now they got to step up to the game and actually work in order to keep that person balanced and give them equilibrium to keep the vestibular stuff going, to keep the muscles and everything fire right. They get a Hemi walker, right? And once they master that Hemi walker, guess what we do? We take away that Hemi walker. We give them a quad cane. Once they get to using that quad cane, other things kick in. The balance is challenged a little more. The strength is challenged a little bit more. The core, the vestibular, everything is challenged more. When they get rid of that quad cane, we advance them to a single point cane. Once they master the single point cane, we go to using nothing. That's what I'm talking about. So it's these steps. And that the thing is that if you keep on giving them this dang on walker, they don't even know. I feel safe. That's the issue. I feel safe. With the walker, but having no idea, the more you use that walker, the more dependent you're going to come, the more weaker you're going to come to the point to where that walker is actually going to be the death of you. So people don't even understand that whenever you do these things like giving folks stuff all the time, all the time, that mentally they're being debilitated and don't even know it because they feel like, well, if they're giving it to us for free or if they're giving it this, I ain't really got to do no work for it, then, you know then that's what I'm saying. You're going to end up becoming debilitated. You're never going to be able to stand on your own two feet. Mentally, emotionally, spiritually, physically, all it's going to do is debilitate you in the end. And then they want to feed you this story like there's some type of thing 
the system or the man or whoever it is people I, I, it, it, it just makes you so mad because all these people all they do is they come up with these concepts just to feed the very dumb ignorant thing that you've been told man we are first of all i'm not trying to say this in no crazy crazy way but i'm asking a legit question any of the subscribers that's out there listen to me right now it's 70 of you guys in here of the 70 people there's 73 people that's in here who in here is black? I'm dead serious. I want to know who in here is black and probably anywhere between, you know, 20, I don't know, 25 and on up. Who in here? I just want to know who in here is black. Probably nobody. <laughs> Considering like 1% of my subs are <laughs> black mixed, whatever. I'm talking about your race is considered to be black slash African American. Y'all telling me what y'all are. I'm just asking who. <laughs> I'm asking in here who is black. Y'all telling me I'm, I'm Caucasian. I'm not asking. <laughs> what in the world? Do you understand the words that are coming out of my mouth? Yeah, Lethal, it looks that way. So anyway, the reason why I asked that because um, I wanted to know out of those black people, like I asked, like a lot of ones I asked today, co-workers. I asked a lot of questions like out of everybody that's in here, the ones that are black, I want to know who in here ever felt the oppression. You know what I mean? Who felt the oppression or felt the 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 downfall of the people, you know, who 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 felt that? Because the thing is, after a while, you just kind of, you know, you really get uh, you really get kind of tired of the whole thing that they keep on feeding us. They feed us that crap all the time. But then I'm sitting there thinking like, well, how did I get out? How did I get out of that? And when it all comes down to it, it's like with anything else. I don't care who you are, what you do. If this right here, if that mind can be trapped and ensnared to believe something, even though it's a lie. Once you do that, everything else is going to follow. The belief system is going to follow. The physiological stuff is going to follow. The uh, emotional stuff is going to follow. People would defend it and don't even know nothing about it. Yes, it is. We are oppressed. We. I'm like, how? 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 Where? Not going to understand that my ancestors was, like my great-great-grandma and all them, but me? Now? No way. And then you know what? It makes them... Uh, it makes them mad is because I tell them this. I say, uh, I say, do y'all even have an idea? Look, the people, just, just think about this, guys. In America, I try to tell, I tell a lot of the youth this. I talk about kings, you know, King Arthur, Henry VIII, even kings and stuff in the Bible. I sit and I tell them, do y'all know that to this day, we have it better than them? You actually are living better than the king. I don't care. I, like I grew up, I, I know what it's like to be in the projects or be in the hood, be in the ghetto, be in low income areas and all that. I know what that's like. But even in those low income areas, I had it better than the kings of old. They didn't have no running toilet water. They didn't have no lights they can flick on and off. They didn't have no heating and air conditioning. They didn't have just no store that they can just walk into. I don't care if it's Aldi's or Save a Lot or Shop and Save. Y'all know them low budget stores. I don't any of those stores. Those kings and queens of the past didn't have none of that, did they? So we have this one saying you try to get them to think about this stuff. We have it better than what they did. But somebody has told you that you're poor. Come on now. Kings didn't have this. They didn't have refrigerators that you can just go put a, a drink in and it to cool it off. They Everything they drank was pretty much room temperature, whatever like that. They didn't have no toilets where they can go use the bathroom in and flush it and the water takes it out. Somewhere like that. Somebody had to go and dump this stuff. So I let them know. I don't care how great we, we read about Henry VIII or I don't y'all know King Arthur, all the kings and stuff of the past. You have it better than them. Flat out. You have it better than them. 
but they don't see it that way. It's all like I said, it's this whole thing that uh, it's this whole mentality of somebody owes you something. Nobody owes you nothing. And then if it was actually break the mold and get out of that, all of a sudden, well, you just some, you know, you just, oh, please don't, don't use that. Try again. That's what I do. Try again. Give me another try. Give, give a better rebuttal. Try again because that's not working. This whole thing of me being smarter than you, or me better than you or nothing. No, absolutely not. You just use it as an excuse for you not want to get up off your butt and take care of business. That's all it is. But the thing is, it's a lot of times it's not their fault. Because they, they've been taught from a young age to think that way. They've been shown from a young age to be that way. Because all they've seen is what their mom did. Or if dad is there, they've seen what their dad did or what their dad didn't do. And it's almost like it's automatic. Mama give them these things. Well, I got to wait for the first of the month to get here, baby. For me to get my food stamps. Then we can go out and get you. So that child already has in their head. Well, I guess when I get old, I'm going to be on food stamps too. But nobody ever tells them. You know you don't have to be on food stamps. What do you mean you don't have to be on food stamps? You know that when you get out of high school, you can apply to college. You know, and you can actually do what you want to do. Nobody even tell. There are so many people that so many different things that me and my wife have helped, like some of these young people sign them up for college, sign them up for Pell Grants and all this stuff like that. They didn't even know about it. Not only that, the school system is not even telling them that they can do that. Not even pushing them. Don't even don't even tell them that. They don't want to tell you what that folks get mad at this too amongst blacks. I tell them it shouldn't be no ooh and ah no more than my that, that blacks are graduating high school. No, puh, ooh we. That's like when, like with my sons. Ooh, don't get me wrong. I'm gonna be proud that my sons graduated high school, but not proud like y'all think. It's gonna be proud just like when my sons graduated the eighth grade or when they graduated kindergarten. It's gonna be the same. I'm there supporting them because they moving on, but it ain't there because it's like, oh my god, another black young man made it through high school. No, to me, ooh, because my sons know that it's expected. It ain't even a question. It's not even a question whether my son's going to graduate high school. It's not even a question like, like I'm supposed to be like real round up that because that's sad that we actually have to get ourselves to the point to where if any blacks graduate high school, it's like, whoa, it's, really? That's crazy. That's absolutely crazy. It's going to be like, yep, I'm proud of my son. He, gonna, he, take, he took care of business. He's going to be moving on, going to college, whatever it is that he want to pursue. I talked to them about what is it that you like, what you don't like, whatever it is that you love doing. What's something that you love doing that nobody would even have to pay you to do? It? What's something that you love doing? My son is very artistic, very good in drawing and, and all that with the colors and all that, with shading and all that. So what does he want to do? He want to go to an, some type of school of art, an art institute school. Now, that's what I'm saying. Nobody is telling these kids these different things. Nobody is actually getting to these kids' heads and minds and letting them know what ability do you have that you love doing. You know, whatever that ability is, whatever that natural skill is that you have, let's see if there's a career in that very thing that you have. Oh, no, it's, well, you know, it's hard to get a young black person to graduate. You, you, can't, you know it's not. You tell them that, yes, but if there's an expectation already set, then it's no question. It's just like in my house. My son's them been with me all this time. There's an expectation. There's an expectation. They know when they get around other family members. When you walk into a house, you speak to other family members. It's expected of them. So what does it look like if my sons then walked amongst other family members and they just walked into the house and we started cheering because my sons then spoke to my aunts or my uncles or my grandma or you know their older cousins? Why, why would I cheer? Oh, my God, look at that. My young black son spoke to his grandma. Woo. No. It's like, good. I, it's, I just don't think about it because it's expected that he's going to go in there and do it. So when it comes to this graduation and all this stuff in high school, it's not like, not like I said again, it's not like I'm not proud or happy, but it's expected. They know it's expected. So that's what I'm saying. But uh, um, it's just that too many times people give them such an easy leeway. Oh, honey, I know you're not doing good in school because, you know, I know you have it hard at home. Well, after a while, there ain't no excuse. You know right from wrong behaviors and all this stuff like that. So even then, even when they do that, you still are giving them a reason to keep on continuing the behavior that you don't want them to display because you're giving them a you giving them a you know giving them a cop out, giving them a way out. Well, the reason why, oh honey, well, oh well, he has a really bad attitude, but it's okay because you know his he's at home with his grandmother, so he has a right. But you don't tell that kid that when he goes to prison, do you? That kid end up doing something he ain't got no business doing to go off the jail or go to prison. Jail, the judge don't be like, well, you know what, son, since you grew up in a fatherless home or a home without a mother, I'm going to have mercy and just give you probation. 
No, you're going to jail for 10 years. I mean, <laughs> just see what I'm saying? So it's almost like it's, it's, it, the, when it when it all comes down to it, it comes from home, plain and simple. Well, the thing is, when it comes to doing that, though, that's what I'm saying. We're like with my sons. That's what I'm saying. You teach them to think. When they come to you and say, "Dad," da 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 da, da I sometimes say, "Well, what do you think?" Well, I think that X, Y, and Z. So when you do that, it causes their wheels to turn so they can actually know how to comprehend or actually know how to take something and actually intellectualize or think logically versus just, well, I always come to him for the answers, so he's going to have it. But it's like, no, what do you think about it? You know, which is what a lot of people need to, uh, which was, which was, which is what a lot of people need to do. You know, so when it comes down to you trying to help or we trying to figure out what's going on in, you know, children's lives or anything like that, are you trying to help one? It's going to come down to individuality. You got to talk to that kid one on one. I said this before. You can talk to crowds of people just like Jesus did, but he had his most impact when he was alone with the person. So I took that little, you know, that little uh, bit of a nugget of what I seen from how Jesus did things and I applied it the same way. Yeah, I could talk to it like, man, like I can talk to a group of kids. They'll act a certain way when there's a lot of them in there, you know. One second. I had a hiccup. So anyway, they'll act a certain way that amongst their friends, which I know that's cool. I know we all done that. But then when I get them off to the side, talk to them individually, then we can get to the heart of the matter. But again, the whole point of it is, is that that's why I said I know some people were against me. They didn't understand the logic on when I told them, what's the point of going to high school? And when you get out of high school, you just nothing. Well, at least you know who the first president is. Well, at least you know who how America was so-called found and all that. At least you kind of know those things right there. But what is it going to have to do with the trade or skill for them to actually go out there and be some productive citizens out in society? They don't teach them how to write no checks. They don't teach them. They don't even teach them. My sons they don't even get taught. They didn't even teach them in cursive. We got to teach them that. They don't even teach in cursive writing them or how to sign a check, how to finance, how to balance anything. No, no real, actual real life skills. But what, hey, but at least he, hey, huh. At least he knew who those presidents was and at least he knew uh, how this war was started and all this stuff like that. You know, at least they give like us that one month where we can learn something about black folks, but the rest of the months don't matter. So, I mean, no. I drink what? That's awesome, dude. And that's what needs to be taught, man. It needs to be taught that, man. It's, and, I'm, I, y'all, and I'm not saying this because, like I said, I made... It makes some folks upset because they expect me to jump on board, be out there marching. Yeah, we are oppressed. No, you're not. No, you somebody that is, you're being lied to. You are not oppressed. You can go to school and do everything else just like any other Chinese, Mexican, white, Caucasian, whatever you want to call it. You can go and do exactly what they're doing to you. If you want to be a stockbroker, you can go to school to be a stockbroker. You just got to put in the time to do it. If you want to be a doctor in need, you can go and be a doctor in MD. Somebody just got to show you what it's like and what you need to do to take out student loans, X, Y, and Z. It's always these things almost like they, that's what I'm saying. So it's like before you can actually put your foot even through the door, somebody scared you and told you something was on the other side of that door that you're not going to like. That's why I tell people all the time. They say, man, you went through school and you did this, you did that. You have these, you have two degrees and, you know, you, you're pursuing this other thing too. Man, that must be hard. No, it's not hard. It's just time. It's not hard. And that's what messes people up because if you've been of a mentality to where you never had to do anything to cause you to have no type of strain, whether it's physically, mentally, emotionally, and the minute somebody say it's hard, oh, man, you just step back. Well, no, you know, right, that's okay. That stuff is too hard for me, man. I, I can't, I can't do that. I, 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 man, that stuff is too hard for me. See what I'm saying? You already talked yourself out of it, not even having no idea that once you got into it. See, the thing is, I always say this. There are people like me. People say, they, I, I say it all the time, and I say this. I thank you for the compliment if you're saying I'm very smart, I'm very wise, I'm very intelligent. I just tell people, no, I'm well learned. Things that I know about anatomy and physiology, I learned those things. That means the things that I learned because I love to do the stuff, I know how to teach the stuff back because I love it so much. I love biology. I love mathematics you know i love spirituality i love this stuff and that's why that's the basis of what i talk about on this channel i love learning new things of hearing of new things that's why i have a reaction channel 
listen to artists and music that I've never listened to before. And yet I gained subscribers because I would talk about songs that some of you guys say, man, I listened to this song for 30 years and I never heard nobody put a spin on it like that. I never even thought about it like that. Things like that is what I'm talking about. But if all we do, just think if I never, hey, like for instance, where I come from, they're like, boy, you listening to what? Cunt country george Strait. oh no no this oh no man see automatically now you trying to make me feel some kind of way or make me feel bad because i'm venturing out what is actually expected of me to listen to all the time rap hip-hop r&b blues but go to country or rock or heavy metal or punk rock or folk music bollywood i don't care all of a sudden oh honey, give me your black car no bro give me your black car so that's what I'm saying. Things like that, when this certain type of mentality has been pressed on you and you even even man, there are so many folks out there that's so different, man. That's why even if y'all notice it's really, really cool. And I've been taught a lot since I started this reaction channel. When I first started off, y'all notice I'm like, oh, my God, he black. I mean, this, you know, this is a black rock and roll, whatever their name is. What is it? Color, colorblind or whatever they are, that rock and roll group. I'm sitting there like, dude, are you kidding me? And I love it because it's so sad, but it's true. when People say, dude. I mean, I can tell who they are. They're like, dude, where you been living under a rock? How do you not know who, you know, uh, who are they called? That black rock and roll group, colorblind or something like that. I don't even remember, though. But anyway, uh, that's what I'm saying. Things like that. All of a sudden, folks that's of that world, like, how do you not know who they are, man? I mean, and it's like, dude, if you only knew. Yeah, living color or something like that. Um, so anyway, that's my point is that now you can make people mad because you don't jump on this bandwagon of, oh, man. You know, hey, this is this should be given this. Oh, you know, us we we as blacks, you know, we are oppressed and they're keeping us down. That's a lie. That's a flat out lie. I don't care what nobody's ain't. That is a flat out lie. When it all comes down to it, if the mentality has been taught to you, whether it's verbally or inverbal or deliberately or indeliberately, and you learn the ways of them things that people do. How to run the system. People know what I'm talking about. If you're in here, you listen, you're black. And even if you are white and you come from that type of background, that mentality, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Then, of course, it's easy for stuff to get handed to you and not have to work for it. It's easy. Why would you step out of that? Well, I'm just going to stay here and stay lowly and da da da. But you'll keep on going there and trying to preach and teach about how the system is keeping you down. They don't care about this. And that's what I'm saying. Then you got on this whole thing about, oh my God, we was at the Walmart and uh, this guy was trying to, I mean, I'm sorry, we was at Sam's Club, and this guy was selling this massage chair, which was really neat. And if he's watching that, oh, well, because you know you did it, you said it. And he's another black guy. And sometimes blacks will say things to each other as if we all going to agree with that. So this woman came over and said she was trying to get something done. And he said, well, I can't do that. And she was like, well, I'll go and do it. He said, well, I wish, and when she walked off, he looked at me and my wife and said, well, I wish I had your white privilege. I'm like, what? What in the world? So here's the thing. What I love about this a lot of times is a lot of people, I'm telling you, we do, all of us do it sometimes. I mean, I'm good at not doing it because I learned over years. But a lot of us will look at each other. We'll judge each other based off of how our dress is. So I guess he figured since I had on my, I have on jogging pants, you know, jogging pants, flip flops, T-shirt, and look fairly normal or common to him, like a common black brother to another. And I guess when he figured he made that comment about, I wish I had your white privilege as if we was going to be like, oh, yeah, yeah, man, exactly. What? Guys, I'm serious. I told you it's going to open up a whole lot of stuff. And I do not care because this stuff needs to be heard, not just by me, but by others as well. That stuff does not exist. It does not exist. Anything I want to go get or do, I can do as a black man. And can't nobody keep me from doing it. If I have the skills, the knowledge, the experience, the ability to do whatever it is that I'm going to try to do. Nobody can keep me from doing that. Now, discrimination, people are still saying these different words. People want to try to act like they're the same thing. Discrimination does not mean racism. Prejudice does not mean racism at all. Racism is just racism, but prejudice and discrimination is not racism. If I'm trying to apply for a job and I got more experience and more of this than the person that's applying for the job and they're white and they get the job, I'm not going to be like, oh, see, there's some discrimination stuff. And I'm like, well, they probably chose the better fit, whoever, whoever they thought was going to be a better fit for the company. I'm not just going to just go, well, why they pick him? Because I'm no, I'm going to go elsewhere until I get what I want to get. I just, and especially the way that I'm lined up with the Lord, 
It's not for me. That's not where God wants me to be. Where God wants me to be, he will put me there. It's not going to be no struggle. It's not going to be no fight. It's not going to be no, I got to work really hard to, no. Where God wants to place me, he probably figured, no, I don't want you there because this place right here is not ready for somebody like you. That's the way that I think. But if I was under this mentality that the reason why I'm not getting this job is that, no. Every job that I wanted, that I wanted in therapy, in medicine, any job that I wanted, I got it. Because the jobs that I applied for that I wanted, I got. I know I beat out a whole lot of applicants and all that. Because guess what? When I went to the interview, I seen it. I'm the only person there that was of color that was applying for it. And I got the job. Because I knew that they hired me based on not my color. They hired me based on my knowledge, my intellectual ability when it comes to healthcare. They hired me because of my experience and my ability. They hired me because of what I showed them on that resume. They knew, for one, dude, we don't care what color you are. All we know is if you can perform this vestibular stuff, and if you can sit there and crack necks and realign people's necks, we want you. How much do you want us to pay you? Plain and simple. That's every job has done it to me. What? Wait a minute. Time out. Wait, 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 wait. Time out. You can actually correct stuck facets. You can actually correct backs. You can actually kind of slow down scoliosis advancement by like 70 percent. Oh, no. Here, here. How much do you want us to pay you? Please. So that's what I'm saying. It, it, it's so crazy that these people draw up these these notions and then when they do that if you go in there with that mindset i didn't get a job it's probably because they gave it to something they gave it. i know they gave it to that white dude because they get out of here you didn't get the job because most likely you weren't the fit that they were looking for you didn't have the knowledge the skills the ability and the experience of the job that you were applying for plain and simple leave it at that it's crazy No, that's just the type of stuff that they that's just the type of stuff that they just want to push. That just that's just what they want to do. You know, giving people in the that's the sad part about it. You you wanna they wanna keep on people wanna this mentality that they're getting fed, it's like they always want to try to have a certain type of you know, they always want to have like try to have like a certain type of mentality. I tell you what, during a during like during an interview, I'm the I'm the one giving the interview. I get an interview, y'all. I'm I'm I'm, I'm telling y'all the flat out truth. I get an interview and a guy comes in there, a white guy comes in there, you know, he shakes your hand. Hey, how you doing? Okay, go ahead and have a seat. So what's, how you doing? Okay, well, he'll tell me his thing now. I'm just telling you, I'm just telling you all the truth. There's been blacks that came in and been interviewed by me. Straight up, professional, did they what they were supposed to do, presented themselves like they were supposed to. There was some that came in there. Oh, snaps. What's up, bro? Oh, man, this is crazy, bro. Hey, hey, this is cool to see a black man. Nope. Because <laughs> already you're going to think that you got some type of, like we got some type of buddy-buddy thing going on now because you come in and you see that the person is interviewing you and uh, as assistant director, you, you've seen that I'm black and all of a sudden it's like, oh, what's going on, homie? Hey, that's cool, man. That's so, hey, let me just tell you, man, I'm so proud to see a black man. Why? No, see, that's what I'm saying. No, absolutely not. And I'm telling you the flat out truth. You you come to an interview, like I had to give it to some. I had to just this uh uh last week. I had to give it to some younger guys too. You saying that they did not call you back for a job after you applied for it, and you went there and you were sagging, dude. Are you nuts? You went and applied. You went to go apply to go work in food to be a cook, and your pants were sagging. I want you. You serious? I mean, so yeah, well, what's wrong with that, dude? Are you not hearing yourself? You showed up to a job where there's food going to be, and you're sagging. Your butt, your drawers is showing. If I go in any restaurant and I see anybody draws, nope, absolutely not. Are you serious? So that's what I'm saying. The fact that even the mentality of them was just like, well, what? Oh what? Oh what? What's wrong? They should be looking at me. Like, oh, you serious? That yeah, you don't you don't need no job. You ain't, you you ain't even mature enough to handle the job right now. If you can't even get your clothes straight, I mean, if you own a job, taking care of business, you going there, you look percent percent more professional. When you out doing your other life, you want to sag and do all that, that. Hey, more power to you. But you showed up to a job with your pants sagging and trying to figure out why they didn't call you back. That's what I'll tell you why they didn't call you back. Because you you were sagging, dude. Are you serious? Well, no, man. I mean. 
I had I, I told him that I worked at another place for three years and I worked here for this many years, man. So I don't understand. I mean, they then they said they desperately need to help, but your booty was showing, dude. They don't they don't want booty help. <laughs> <That's what I'm laughs> That's what I'm saying. So even the fact that, you know, I hate it because, guys, I'm just being honest. I take that and you go talk to a group of white kids, Mexican kids, Asian kids. The mentality is completely different. Depends on the area because there are those type, those same races that I just named. They grew up near the hood or what they want to call near the trailers or anything like that. In that type of environment with that type of mentality thinking, it's the same process. Well, I can't do nothing because you showed up with some jeans on and a wife beater with gravy stains on it. What are you talking about? No, you're not gonna get hired. You come in there with a you came in there with overalls on with a wife beater on under it, and you applying to go cook in the kitchen? No, you look nasty. That means you man, you probably had dirt all in your fingernails. No, I don't care who you are. Oh man, uh oh, who is it? She knew it. whoever it is. If she needs to go ahead and drop the bomb, go ahead and do it because I don't know what it is because I don't even see what's going on, guys. If you are asking me questions or anything like that, I can't see them right now. The camera that I used to have had a little window right here that showed me what you guys were saying, but now I got to keep looking from here and over here to the computer and I can't see that. Yeah, Bob Morris, exactly. They don't need they don't need no booty help. They don't want none of that. Absolutely not. So anyway, that's what I'm saying is that um, a lot of them don't want to. What, what, what happens is that this this they they emotionally they start to get angry when you start to coming at them like that, and they think it's not you're not fair. No, I'm fight out fair, and I tell them in the heartbeat, dude. I don't care what nobody guys. I'm just being honest to you guys. I'm I don't care. I'm just being flat out honest. I can say this now because I don't hire people. When I was in Florida, I was on the I was with the help with hiring, okay? Even though you're not supposed to discriminate, in your mind, you do. The minute somebody walked through the door, the minute you walk, if I have businesses and you listening to this and you plan on coming to work for me, you walk in to do an interview with me and you sagging and you ain't dressed accordingly, I'm gonna give you the best interview you ever had. I'm gonna be nice to you. But I'm already not hiring you. Yes, I, in my in my head, I discriminated because you got some sagging pants on with your draw showing. Yep. Yes. And if there, I know there's, and you know, employees employees that do the hiring, they can't say this out loud. They can't. They can only keep it in here. But they do it too. They do it too. And if you don't, you're sitting there lying. Well, you never know. The guy that's sagging could be the nicest guy in the world. He, yes, he could. But the fact that he couldn't even most, he couldn't even notion up enough respect to come to an interview without his booty showing. No, no, absolutely not. Absolutely not. I will not do it at all. So anyway, like I said, you know, people get mad because. Um, oh, G56. Absolutely. Absolutely. See, the thing is, because a lot of times here's the thing. What needs to be learned is that, see, when you hit with a type of truth. Real when you when you hit with a type of truth. The response is always anger. They can't even hear what you're saying right now because emotionally they just ready to they just ready to defend. No, you, no, you, you they, see. But it's like you, you want to try to get these people. To look, calm your emotions down. Listen to what I'm saying logically before you let your emotions get in the way. You know, listen to what I'm saying logically. And then you sitting there trying to tell these people the truth. They don't know your history. They don't know your background. So they think all of a sudden, well, yeah, man, it's because I know you probably had you know your mom and dad. Nope. You know, you probably because you grew up over there on a nice, uh, nope, been around drive by shootouts, seeing folks getting killed in our face, finding a dead body and all that stuff like that. So, no, absolutely not. It comes all down to a mentality. You have to make the decision. This is not the life that I want to live. Single mothers, if you're listening right now, single moms, because most of the Jordan black communities are single moms or even single fathers. If you're even out there, find out what it is that your child likes to do. Have, do you pay attention to your child to see what do they do naturally? What's something that they do as a hobby besides being in their dang on phone? I ain't talking about nothing like that. Does your child draw? Do they make music? Do they play an instrument? Do they Are they always climbing the tree or always running and jumping all over the house? 
those right there are skills and qualities that might lead this child into a career that they want to do. So what you need to do is encourage them to do that very thing that you see them doing, whether it's drawing. I don't care. Coloring. Like I said, making music, doing something athletic all the time, running, jumping, sprinting, climbing trees, always want to go to the park and swing on stuff. That right there is showing you that they, these, these children have a natural ability or talent or a skill that you need to pay attention to. And whatever it is that they're doing so good, so naturally that they're great at, you need to put them somewhere where it's going to enhance those skills even further. That's going to end up being their career. That's going to end up being their job. That's going to end up being the very thing that they're going to do. So therefore, even if you do say things like you have to work hard, well, no, 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 absolutely. If it's something like my mentor, Dr. Beckman, told me before, if it's something that you love doing, you will never have to work a day in your life. I love doing what I'm doing. I love talking to people. I love helping people. I love encouraging people. Making you know, I love making lead point people in the right direction, whether it's physically, spiritually, emotionally. I love doing this stuff so it doesn't feel like it's work to me. It's actually a hobby. I love talking, as y'all can see. So whatever it is that comes natural to me, I do that. And if there's a career in that, then you can get paid for it. So then it comes comes, comes weird. Like you, what I do now, therapy, and moving on to uh, futuristically, physician assistant, that um, doing this stuff does not feel like, oh, I got to go to work. No, I get to go do things that I love doing. I get to meet new patients that got new stories, that got new philosophies that I'm going to help make better. And it's, it never gets boring because I love doing it. It's the same thing as people that, that got these extraordinary. Now, the only difference is certain careers pay more, you know. So some people say, well, you know, I love doing this, but it don't pay good. Who cares? Who cares? Because if you do what you love, it doesn't feel like you're working for it anyway. So that's what I'm saying. The whole thing that I push, that I teach right from the jump is everything I tell you guys at the end of all my videos, food, shelter, clothing and health. You teach those foundations to your children, period. That's the focus. That's the focus. The focus is to have food, shelter, clothing, and great health. Now, of those four things, you tell them to strive to have those things, and then it comes naturally. Strive to have better health. Strive to have food. Strive to have clothing. Strive to have shelter. You don't care what, what level of economics is on as long as you have it, period. It's just like I was teasing somebody over this. They said, well, you know, I don't know about those, all these pineapple." I like the I like the Sam's pineapple. A pineapple is a pineapple. Like all the <laughs> it's like they both sit there and say imported from Hawaii. Well, since this pineapple went to Sam's, that's a better pineapple. And since this pineapple went to all these, nah, nah. It's the same pineapple. An apple is an apple that came from an apple orchard. It might have came from a different country, but it's still an apple. Well, you know them all these apples, mmm, but them Sam's apples, ooh, it's an apple. It still has malic acid. It still has I me. Mean, what? So what I'm saying, therefore, is that, uh, you know, it's all about what, what is being taught to these people. You're teaching these folks how to think. And one of the number one things you do, like with my sons, you know, it ain't that I'm saying, you guys, we don't watch TV, but we don't have cable. So if there's no cable, then my sons don't have no desire to see what's on TV because it's never been there. Like, like, I'm not trying to be funny. I'm not trying to come down on this subscriber. But one subscriber asked me, told me that their four year old has a problem and their eight year old has a problem because every time she would bring snacks in the house, she says she's tried hiding them in the cupboards up high. They find ways to get to it, but she don't want her kids to be obese. She says, so what can she do? Stop buying snacks. Not trying to be mean. Not trying to be funny, but y'all gotta understand there's certain people of a certain mentality that sometimes something that simple, it just it never crossed their mind because they only doing what their mom did. Well, my mom kept snacks in the house for us, and I am obese too. Yeah. Well, how did you your mom your, well, my mom's obese, my grandma's obese, my great grandma's obese. And but we, that's our family is known for pies and snacks. That's like our tradition. Well, it's killing y'all too, and you're gonna kill your kids. And what'd you say? Your great grandma died at 60, and your grandma died at 57. And you say your mom is 45 and she's diabetes, has type 1 diabetes, and they talk about she might lose her foot. And you saying y'all keep snacks and cakes and that's what do you think is going to happen to you and your children? So it's simple. Don't buy them. Well, then what are my kids going to eat? Trust me when I tell you. Whatever's in your refrigerator. Put apples in there. Put strawberries in there. Put blueberries in there. When your kids see that there ain't no chips and no Debbie cakes in that cabinet and all they see is that in the refrigerator, they say, Mom, what are we going to eat? So eat what's in the refrigerator. 
We don't want that. Give it by the time that day is over with, watch they be in there smashing them strawberries. I don't care. <laughs> Cause your stomach don't care. Your stomach don't care if you want those Debbie cakes or not. Your stomach gonna say, hey, hey, look, hey. Look, look, sister, look, brother, you ain't feeding us. Look, brother, it's been about five hours and we hungry now. Them, hey, hey, we just gotta hey, forget them chips and those daddy cakes. Hey, mama said there's some blueberries and strawberries and bananas and stuff in the refrigerator. I think you better go get one of the bananas. I'm oh, mad. Pretty soon, you gonna you gonna trust you gonna cave to that body. That body gonna say, I don't care what's in that refrigerator. Go in there and eat something. I do not care. So <laughs> it's all about what's been put here. Guys, there's another thing I know is going to be against it. See, all these things that we were just talking about in here, these things have been passed down as almost if it's tradition. The victim mentality, the somebody owing you something mentality, these things have been passed down from generation to generation to generation, whether it's verbally, whether it's through them watching what others have done, whether it's, uh, it's being taught to them, whether it's being shown to them. It's being passed down from generation to generation to generation to generation. And without thinking logically, they just repeat what the other one done. And that's the same thing that happens with people that have these inherited issues. You might have heart disease because it runs in the family. No, you have heart disease because it runs in the family because you've eaten what everybody else ate in your whole family that's been passed down. You might have high blood pressure because it runs in the family. No, because everybody in your family like to put salt on everything. You might have diabetes. Because it runs in the family. Oh, is it because of, you know, some people do have a legit thing to where the body doesn't do right with the insulin and the pancreas and all that. But for the ones that it's type two, oh no, it's because you eating wrong, plain and simple. But nobody's telling you that. Well, I do like to eat my vegetables. I like I eat green beans and I eat this. I might put some cheese on it and some uh, you know, but no, no, no. So anyway, as y'all can see, I love I love discussions like that because the thing is, you get to a point to where you get tired of it. I mean, man, and you know, if people understand that a lot of these organizations that are actually out there are for you, no, they they are for using you to push their agenda, which all is going to come down. It's going to come down to money. It's going to come down to money. It's going to come down to money. I don't care who it is. Al Sharpton, Jesse Jackson, some of the Rainbow Coalition, NAACP, always want to jump on board when it's race relations. Well, the race relations is black on black. Ain't nobody saying nothing doing nothing about that. I guarantee you probably 15 people died today in Chicago. Ain't nobody marching for that. But let a white person kill one of them black folks. All of a sudden, here we go. Here we go. Let's get it on. Let's get all the Black Lives Matter out there and all this stuff out there. Let's get all of them out there. But, you know, if I'm black and I kill another black, yeah, that don't matter. But if you white and you kill another black, oh, now we got an issue now. Let's see. That's what I'm saying. It's crazy. So that's what I'm saying. And I tell people all the time, think. It's not for you. I don't care how they try. To, oh, yeah, they're going to support you if somebody did something to your child and they have a different, if they white and they do something to your child, they'll be there to support you so they can put you all on the news and push their agenda so they can get funds and stuff coming in that's going to feed them. But for what? For what agenda? For what? Casey Corner, I'm telling you, you're darn right. Yeah, Bob Morse, they tried to get me to join. I didn't. I'm not joining any of that. See, the thing is, I'm a y'all, y'all, some of y'all that's been with me for a long time, you know that I'm flat out, I'm real. I'm real with this stuff. I don't care. I already know what they're gonna do. Get this guy up here who got success, who came out of this, who did this. Get him up there and speak on behalf of us to represent us so I can keep on keeping people like me suppressed, oppressed. Yeah. Yeah, please. No, absolutely not. I do the same way God did it. Ask young black man, do you want to get out of this? Do you want to know what it's like to be successful? We're not talking financial. We're talking being successful, being fully balanced, equilibrium when it comes to your life, your thinking, your mentality, any of that. Do you want that right there? Because when you, you have to have the mentality, you have to have the emotional toughness to deal with these certain things. And then other stuff is going to come. That other stuff will come. Money will come. Good friends will come. But you first got to have yourself set in the mindset to where you actually are willing to accept these things. But they don't want that because you, you want it. Well, I want it. I want the stuff free. I don't want to have to work for it. 
That's why this whole no child left behind bull crap is one of the worst things they could have done. We don't care how stupid you are. You're passing to the next grade. We don't care how dumb you are. You're passing to the next grade because when you get out of here, that's on you. You can't talk right. You can't write right. You don't know what it's like to fill out a resume because guess what? You don't even know how to put a sentence structure together. But we don't care because we pass you on from the first grade all the way through high school. And now you can't go get a job because you don't know how to talk. You don't even know how to sit in an interview and talk. You don't even know how to answer a question. You don't even know how to read really yet. You don't even know how to calculate anything if they need you to write it on paper. But guess what? No child was left behind, but you left. No child was left behind. But when you get out of high school and become an adult, the adult is left behind. And that's why all of a sudden now I can't do nothing. I can't get a job. So I got to depend on the system. Boom. No, see, the thing is, I think uh, like Dr. Beckman tells me a lot. He says this thing where it says, uh, yeah, I know, Bob, and it's sad. It's sad, dude. You know, in Shy town it's sad. Dr. Beckman always says he who has the most contributes the most. He who has the most value contributes the most. It's all about that. It's all your, your value is in who you are. And I like what uh, y'all seen this a rapper on here named uh, that I listen to that I like a lot from Chicago named Jim Stones. And I like one of the things he said. He said, success is not defined by what you got, but by the things you overcome when you've been through a lot. I love that. Absolutely love that right there. Uh, one mountain cat one. That's right. When you say depend on God, the father. But guess what? Even then. You depend on God, but actually God is going to want God. Don't just say I'm going to do everything for you, because guess what? Most of the people that Jesus did stuff for, he actually he actually counted on them to do something. So just think about when Jesus healed somebody. He told the man, will you be made whole? The man said, yes. He said, well, take up your bed and walk. So he required that man to do something. The blind man that he healed, he told him, go wash your eyes. He did it. He did what he needed to do. He said, go wash your eyes in the water. And the man did it. The person that had the withered hand. Jesus told him to stretch forth his hand. So in other words, Jesus required him to do something. He didn't just go bing and it was done. You know, some stuff, but I'm just saying, I'm just giving you an example about that. Like a lot of times when it comes to things with belief in God and Jesus and all that, Jesus like, hey, um, I have it right there for you, but you not trying to come to it. You're not trying to come to it. It's the same exact, I'm telling you, it's, it's the same exact process, man. But the thing is that if somebody puts you, you know, like right now, I have a lot of people that I make mad when I go, whenever we go and speak in churches, they get mad because I said, who's who just sitting, who just sitting around waiting on the Lord to come? I'm just going to tarry till he comes. People are, amen, amen. I said, well, y'all have lost y'all mind. I'm not about to just be sitting here and I'm just going to wait and I'm going to tarry. But until he comes, I'm just going to stay depressed and I'm just going to stay down and lowly to watch this world go to hell in the hell. No, I'm going to have fun. I'm going to do all the great things I want to do. I'm going to enjoy family. I'm going to eat. I'm going to great, make great memories until the day that I leave this earth. But I'm not just about to be sitting around and just waiting. I'm just waiting on that great day. But until that day comes, I'm going to watch this world just get worse and worse and just keep on praying and just, no, uh, no, no, no. Nope. I refuse to be like that. That's terrible. That's a terrible way to live in Christ. That's a terrible way to be. It's just sitting and waiting. No, absolutely not. Well, that's why the important thing that like what we do or like what I do, if it's just one individual, guys, that's awesome. You help one individual to do something. It's life changing. I cannot begin to tell you of the kids that we've helped before. It's absolutely life changing. It's worth more than any money you can ever any money you can ever have. It's way more valuable to see a life completely changed. To see a person become successful, like I told y'all the other day, I said, now people that I've helped before and don't even know it, they own businesses and stuff now. Look at the benefits that I reap from that. Now they talk about anytime you want to come to my restaurant and eat, Thailand, you can come to my restaurant and eat anytime, man. Anytime you want to come to my restaurant, Thailand, anytime you need to get your tires done or anything like that, bring them over here. We're going to get you a new set of tires every time because you the one to actually, you the reason why I got this tire shop anyway. Man, anytime you want to come to my, uh, my self own uh, grocery store or something like that. You can come in here or whatever, on gas station. You can come and get you a slushie anytime. You always talk about something. Come and get you a slushie from my store anytime because you encourage me to actually, I mean, that's what I'm saying. So the stuff by you changing one life can have la long life lasting benefits to it. I'm talking about 
doctors, lawyers, whatever. I got people that I've helped in so many different avenues that I really don't find. On, I mean, gosh, you, you hardly find yourself paying for anything because you got so many friends in different networks that the stuff is given back to you because of what you did. And it's all come down to words, words, words help change a person's thinking words help change a person's life to where now this person is better or y'all we are here if y'all was here tonight that the girl i'm not saying her name that the girl was talking about uh possibly committing suicide and a lot of you guys in here including myself you know we all encouraged her it changed her thinking around she's doing a whole lot better she felt better not just feeling better but she got better Kept on joining in on the chat room. She emailed, she emails me now and then telling me all the new upcoming things she got going on. But that night was going to be it for her. Or the one guy I told y'all about who sat there and took the pictures and showed me of all the medications that he was getting ready to take to take himself out on a particular night. But he listened to a review that I did. And I think it was Chris Stapleton's uh, fly, Fire Away. He heard what I said at the end of that and was just like, dude, he said he could not sleep. He just had to try to figure out a way to get in contact with me whatever like that. There's been people that actually know and they hear me talk about Dr. Becton a lot. They literally looked up Dr. Becton, found where his practice was, called Dr. Becton's practice to leave a message for Dr. Becton to get a hold of me to tell me who they were so I can get in touch with them. I'm telling you, all from words. Words changed a person's life completely around. Words changed somebody's physical and mental state from words words of encouragement words of empowerment and the cool thing about that is that you get to actually stay with them and see this person what i call grow and develop into something and now because of that they come back and they thank you they want to give you stuff free no man there's no way i can have you pay for this what you did is worth way look at the benefits in doing that but in the um in the society that we live in it's almost like we can have it to where, hey, I'm telling y'all, especially when a lot of, I'm just, I'm just being real. That's all I'm saying. Especially when a lot of blacks, uh, whether it's black churches and stuff like that, I'm talking church, I'm talking society, I'm talking job wise. If a, a lot of blacks, once they have what we call made it successfully on the financial state, it's like I want to be up here just so I can be remain important. And if anybody try to come up here to look like me, I'm not gonna grab their hand and pull them up. I'm going to be like, ah, you know, stay down there because they do it in churches a lot too. People love when I come to their church. They want me to join their church. They want me to minister there and preach there. But then all of a sudden, people get to a point where I can we rather just actually have Thailand be the take over the church because he's leading us somewhere. And our old pastor, he really ain't. Oh, that's when the problem's going to start. They don't, you know, you don't want that. So what I'm saying is that um, in a society that we live in, is, you know, for one, especially the area of like Chicago, going towards Decatur, Illinois, it's what we call a crab like mentality. Anytime somebody about to crawl to the box, all of a sudden, dude, you will sell out, man. You will sell out food. It's the crab mentality. Crabs, I don't know if y'all know about this. Y'all heard it before, where if a crab is getting ready to crawl out something, the other crab is just grabbing to pull them back down. That's what they call it. It's a crab-like mentality. But then yet at the same time, what makes it even more hard is that if one of the ones do make it out, the crab is not turned around and reaching down and grabbing the other one to pull them up there with him. And I said this before, and I say it again, and some of you guys might have heard it before. One of the things that I told you guys, I learned a lot of things like that the video I did the other day, Alice, whatever his name is, uh, I learned from hearing his thing. I said, I can use that as a message when I'm preaching or teaching. So anyway, what I'm saying this for is that, the, I'd say this before, it's a movie called uh, Rockstar with Mark Wahlberg. One of the most awesome messages that I've used everywhere I've gone. And if y'all haven't seen it, it's an awesome movie. In Rockstar, Mark Wahlberg was just this huge fan of this group that he loved, this rock band that he loved. He absolutely loved, idolized this group, right? And so it's a part in there where this man, his the main guy he idolized, Mark Wahlberg had the clothes on like this guy. And when the guy got them, got ready to do that, stand up and shine. Mark Wahlberg is down in the audience while this man is up on the stage. Mark Wahlberg started hitting that note. That man gave him a look like, hmm. But the man got away from him. He's like, wait a minute now. Hold on. This kid didn't, uh, no, this ain't about to happen. So that rock star started going on the other side of the stage. Well, Mark Wahlberg went through the crowd and went back on the stage, steady idolizing this man, thinking like, oh, man, I'm, I'm, he, he idolizing this guy. That guy got ready to sing a note again. Mark Wahlberg hit that note with dude too. Just hit it with him. And the guy was like, huh, no, I don't think so. So anyway, what ended up happening, Mark Wahlberg was able to audition for this same rock band that this guy that he idolized was the lead singer of. Mark Wahlberg got the got the lead role, 
you know, long story short, great success, had a pretty much, you know, great success, did all the things that, you know, that they say a lot of rockets fell into, you know, uh, adultery, cheating, sex, drugs, whatever like that. But towards the end, Mark Wahlberg was in the same predicament that that guy that he idolized was in. Mark Wahlberg's up there on stage getting ready to hit a note. There was a young man down there in the crowd that had the same outfit on. Mark Wahlberg got ready to hit that note. That guy started hitting that note, too. And what I love about it is what Mark Wahlberg did. He kind of smiled a little bit. He grabbed that guy's hand and pulled the guy up there, pretty much put him on the same level that he did, and pretty much like, this is the future. Even though I reached my pinnacle, but this guy right here is going to be the future. Mark Wahlberg pulled that guy up and handed the dude the mic and said, it's yours, man. The dude's like, are you serious? He's like, yeah, it's yours, man. And Mark Wahlberg walked away. So what I'm saying is that that's what needs to be happening in a lot of our communities, whether you're black, white, whatever. When you reach a level of what we want to call success, not just necessarily financially, but spiritually, uh, physically, emotionally, whatever the case may be, whatever success that you may have that you can offer to somebody, we like to keep this. A lot of us like to keep that stuff to ourselves. Mm-mm, nah, stay beneath me. We don't want to do that. We don't want to grab the hand and pull them up there and put them on the same level as us. Why not? Because if that same pattern continues, look how much more people we can pull up and put this on our level so all of us can be successful together. But we don't want that because somebody always wants to be the number one. You want to be the man. You want to be the woman. You want to be the successful one. But you don't want to have successful ones. You know, and there's nothing wrong with doing that. There's no challenge to that. I mean, gosh. I hope that all the ones that I've mentored and taught even my own self, I hope they be better than me. I want them to be better than me. I push for them to be better than me. Intellectual wise, thinking wise, technology wise, you know, emotional wise, being able to handle shots being thrown at them, being able to not to actually roll with the with, don't roll with the masses or anything. Like I want my son to do the same exact thing that I do. I want my nephews and nieces the same way. My mentor reads the same way. Uh congregation people of church members, the same exact thing. All right, Dennis Lawson, you have a good night. So as you can see, this conversation just got deep. And I know that I'm not, guys, I told you, I apologize in advance that there's no way that I was going to, the way I'm going right now, I can't, I can't even begin to read the comments, but I'll go back. I have to go back and go up there. So somebody said, and cousins, Cynthia Francis, are you related to me? Is Detroit here? Mood reviews, appreciate it. I seen somebody say cousins, so I ain't know if we you cousins that we was just in Tennessee or. Uh, the working class has lost one third of their wealth in the last few years, while the upper class has seen theirs double. How's that our fault? Well, here's the thing. Um, if you're asking me that, first of all, it's gonna come down to this: what do you define as wealth? Because where I come from, how I grew up, if you made twenty thousand dollars a year, you was balling. But for a person that twenty thousand, you might make fifty thousand dollars a year. You look at twenty thousand dollars like what? Twenty thousand dollars is balling? Uh, how? How? Because there's some people that lived on the income. They got four or five, four or five kids, and their income yearly with a job at McDonald's, or something like that, is thirteen, fourteen thousand dollars a year. So making twenty thousand or twenty five thousand to them, that's balling. So if you asking me that, uh, my wealth since starting to work has more than just quadrupled or quartillion or whatever you want to call it. It has done way more than that. And um, when you say uh, as far as wealth go, I'll give you an example. I'm not going to go into it because that's for another conversation. But I'll give you an example. There's a man that I give credit to named Bill Spann in Florida. He was a patient of mine. I didn't know who he was. I treated the man like he was anybody else. But I found out that he's a super very wealthy man. And he talked to me about investing. And he taught me something that's called covered calls. I don't know if y'all know what that is, but I know what it is. And if you don't know what it is, it's something that's really, really easy to do when it comes to investing because you do the work. You watch stuff rise and you watch stuff fall, just like you do analytics. So 
he taught me to do some things like that. Now, wealth, as far as you, what you consider wealthy, <laughs> it, that's all a mindset. What is wealth? What is what? what what's, when you say wealthy, we just talking money. You know, so that's what I'm saying. It's all how you've been taught to think about this stuff. How how have you been taught to think about money? You know, so to me, does it matter that somebody's wealth has tripled or doubled, but that person is depressed? That person lives under constant anxiety. That person has to live under stress of whether somebody in their job is working for them might be stealing from them. They got to make sure that their accountant is not stealing from them. Got to hire, hire a private investigator to make sure that their account of that account is not still. See, all that stuff comes with a certain type of stress. So, oh, yeah, you got the money. But then my question comes down to this. You, you, you have wealth when it comes to economics to do what with? Like right now, let's say right now I have an extra fifty thousand dollars to do what with? Just so I can say, ah. I have fifty thousand dollars that I don't have to do anything with, so I'm there. Yeah, to do what with? Because those four pillars that I talk about at the end of my videos—food, shelter, clothing, and health—what <laughs> else? Well, I might be able to get a fancier car, but guess what? That car's still gonna get me from point A to point B, just like my truck does. It might be a little faster, but it's still gonna get me from home to work, just like my truck will. Just like my Traveler, you know, my to the Traveler, you know, that sucker that can go from zero to 60 in two minutes. My Cavalier can get me from home to work just like my truck can. So when we talk about wealth, what are we talking about? Are we talking about economics or are you talking about the knowledge and the wisdom that you gain throughout life? Because money, I, I had this, what y'all see right now, which y'all always kind of, you know, give me compliments and all that stuff on. I had this positivity. I had this mindset before I even had a great career. It was already there. I did not care. I had a, I, I had it while going through college, waking up in the morning, going to college from 7 a.m. to 2 a.m. to have track practice from 2 to 3.30 or 4 o'clock and then to go to work from 5 o'clock to 11 o'clock to get home to talk to my wife, kiss my kids if they not sleep yet uh, at, the, at the time going through college. Good night to study from 12 o'clock to two o'clock next morning to repeat and wake up at five and wake up to go to school again at seven the mentality was already there there was no money there was no you know balling but I, guess what the same mentality the same happiness the same positivity is still there the money had absolutely nothing to do with it and it never will well yeah it says the it says uh case i hear what you're saying but it actually says the love of money is the root of all evil not the money it's the love of it hell absolutely absolutely that's what i'm saying what that hell that's the question what you just got done saying is the answer that i was looking for when i sat there and said you have this money but to do what with you know what i'm saying now i understand people say they save for a retirement i get that but like right now if you have an extra up some thousand dollars in your account and do you know of any family member right now that you know that they live paycheck to paycheck and you can just easily without no strings attached, you can just easily drop them two hundred dollars right now. And say, you know, do something nice with you and your kids or something like I know you live paycheck to paycheck, whatever like that. Matter of fact, I want to if you don't. I'm just being real. If you don't trust them, you tell them I want to take your kids to Six Flags. or I want to take your kids to this golf club place to play putt putt and take them to get a sandwich just to give them that memory that will last. I'm telling you guys the most enriching things that ever happened to me was not money that was given to me. It was a time spent from mentors, from father figures, from mothers. I call mothers in church, the mothers in the church, whatever you may have that time that they spent with me to talk with me, to take me somewhere to like some of the men in the church. A lot of times whenever, you know, a lot of us young men in the church didn't have no fathers, but men in the church, they would sometimes out there take us, we'd just go and we'd play basketball or whatever like that at a, at a park or at a gym. After we got done, they took us to steak and shake. We sat around, we talked. Those are the most enriching and most memorable things that will always stick with me. I didn't care. No, no. I'm so happy he paid for my food. No, no, no. It's the time that they spent. It's the message that they talked about. It's the life lessons that they sat down and talked to us about that was the most life-changing things. Not no money or anything like that. That's why it comes down to I don't care what you say to me about how I can better myself because a lot of kids in the hood where I come from, we don't, we're not shown how to do it. So for instance, I'll give you an example. I was always told this, 
Ty, you can do whatever you want as long as you put your mind to it. Well, guys, guess what? I didn't know what that meant. I don't know. I, I didn't know what it meant to put my mind to something. What does that mean? What does it mean to put my mind to it? See, some kids are feel a little bit embarrassed to even raise their hand and say, what does it mean to put your mind to it? Because they've never been shown how to do that. So all day long, you can encourage kids all you want to by saying, just, you know, apply yourself. You can if you can achieve it. If, no, that's bull. Don't you can achieve it if you believe it. I can believe it, but I don't know how to do it. So my point is that when you say things to children all the time or like kids, teenagers, you can do whatever you want as long as you put your mind to it. You need to actually go into a little bit more detail of what it means to put your mind to something because they really don't know. I didn't know. I just, oh, OK. The heck does it mean to put my mind to it? Put my mind to what? What does that even mean? What, is, what does it mean to put your mind to? It? Well, apply yourself. Well, my vocabulary in high school was not that good, so I didn't even know what they meant by apply. What do you mean apply myself? What does that mean? How do, what, do, what does it mean to apply myself? So I just kind of nod my head. I had no idea what that meant. I'm just telling you all the God honest truth. So it came, if it went for me and my type of curiosity, my personality, I actually was able to go and start asking these questions about, hey, how do I do this? And they said, okay, so Ty, this is what you do. You do, I'm like, oh, that's all I had to do? Yeah, man, that was easy. Yeah, man, that's all. So that's what it means to put your mind to it. So that's my point, y'all. Anyway, it's uh, about three minutes, three minutes till. Uh, tube viewer, absolutely. You can email me, tube viewer. I do this all, I, what you're talking about all the time. Well, Guy Lord, you said one of the issues is how corporations are allowed to allow so many loopholes and help to make money while the workers get screwed, constantly avoiding paying taxes. Now, the question will come down to it, Guy Lord, is this. I'm the type of person, I go to them, the very people you're talking about, I go to them and be like, hey, how do you avoid that? <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm telling you the truth. You learn to do what you, if you learn to do what's called cover calls and all that, that money that's there, and you're like, okay, well, I can pull from that money, but it's going to be a penalty. Not if I transfer it to the bank and let the bank use what they do, because the bank just takes your money and they they do the same thing. They put it in stocks and all this stuff like that. That's what they do with your money anyway. So if I have an investment or even if I have a retirement, if I want to draw from my retirement, they say it's going to be a penalty. Well, guess what? There's a loophole where your retirement say, well, unless you move it to another type of retirement. Well, guess what? I can tell my bank, hey, I want to step a little small IRA. I want to move my money from my retirement and put it in the bank. And then the bank say, well, you got to at least have it in here for a year. The bank can hold on to your money for a year. Well, you weren't going to use it anyway while I was with your job, right? And so you can move that some of that money out of your IRA and put it into a bank IRA. Let the bank do what they're going to do with it. Then move it into your checking account without having to have no penalties or anything like that. So it won't be considered like you just made some extra. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. And I learned this only from those rich patients that I told you all about. All because I asked. I'm, I'm telling you. Oh, I'm sorry. I just got advised I don't have a video till 9.30, so don't worry. We're still good. Oh, Ian McGrath, that's, um, hey, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I'm, that's what I'm all for. I'm all for, if you're doing good with a better business or anything like that, it's all for congratulating somebody on that. That's awesome. I hope it continues to flourish and have success in it. Absolutely. Yeah, I read the Think and Grow Rich. I think that is what's his all oh, man of guys on the tip of my tongue. He got he has a very it's not Earl Nightingale. Oh, I can't think of his name because I have that <laughs> sad. I have the book. I can't believe I don't remember his name. I usually I usually know this game. Oh yeah, uh, uh oh. It's on the tip of my tongue. The short, okay, the short guy in Napoleon. His name is Napoleon or something. Yeah, I think Napoleon, right? What's his name, y'all? It's like, ooh, these cameras are flying. Maine Coon Lady, I just told you. We just said the loophole. I don't know what, who, I don't know what organization you might be a part of or anything like that. You can pull out of your IRA. I just I just gave you an example. They won't let you pull it out. I don't know what like in, in medicine. I don't know what organization y'all are part of, but pulling from the IRA and telling them I'm moving it to another IRA, which is an IRA you can set up with your bank. Your bank will take that IRA 
and do what they do with it and say you have to keep it in here for a year. Then you can take that and just say, I want to transfer this actually my checking account. So what they when we just talked about the loopholes, look it up. Because the thing is what they call it, they call it like rolling over into it. They call it like rolling over into another IRA. And I'm pretty sure. I don't know who you're with, but I, from what I've done, I'm just saying I've done it. I don't get penalized for that. I don't get penalized when I roll it over to a, a different IRA or anything like that. Because you're doing pretty much what the IRA is doing. Your IRA is doing nothing more than actually putting your money in different portfolios. That's what they're doing with your money. So even if you wanted to move it into, I don't know, AFLAC, if they got a whatever, or I don't know what organization you're part of, but if you wanted to move your money, they roll it over to it. There's no penalty in that. Oh, okay, yeah, Napoleon Hill. Thanks for that. Thanks for that. I'm trying to tell you, I learned, uh, uh, that's why I just, I don't know. I just always question stuff. If I want to know how these people that, uh, that's considered wealthy, which in the eyes of a lot of my family, that's what they consider me. But again, they looking at it from a certain man. Y'all see what I'm telling, I'm telling you. I, my mom would tell my mom would tell a lot of people this, and also some family members that know me, even church members. If y'all hung out with me and I was around my family, y'all would look and think that yeah, he probably the one that. Because a lot of my family members, they are they are they are fashionable. They get they gonna have their shoes, they gonna have them J's, they gonna have that Gucci, they are gonna have them, they gonna have that baby, they gonna have them, them clothes on. And then here I am, I show up, I have on a t-shirt and jogging pants, I have on a t-shirt and some khaki shorts. And if you looked at that, you'd be like, oh, yeah, he probably ain't the one that's. <laughs> oh, man. They were like, oh, yeah, that guy right there, you know, the one with that hair. He probably he probably ain't the most, you know. <laughs> and then with my pickup truck, they're like, uh, what does he do? He don't. And they find out what I do is like, for real? He do? He is? I love that. Well, man, coon lady, in today's economy, I'm pretty sure it'd be easy to pull to pull a hardship. <laughs> yep, Elvis. I, Elvis, that's what I'm saying. I know it because I do it. That's what I'm trying to say. Cynthia, where's she at? Where'd she go? Yeah, Stephen, I used to do that, man, because uh, when I lived in Florida, I missed that. Where did Cynthia go? My cousin is here. Cynthia, are you here? Did you go to bed? Cynthia said, Cynthia, are you my cousin from Detroit? You the one that I met and you told me that you bought a T-shirt and all that? Oh, hey, there you are. Cynthia, are you the one that, you know, we hugged and all that? And you told me uh, I, you didn't see me on Friday, but you wore the T-shirt on Friday and then I saw you on Saturday. I think the biggest the biggest thing when it comes to a lot of things like that, guys, is that it's uh oh okay, well how you doing? I'm glad y'all made it back safe. I heard that it was like a, a 12 or 13 hour drive. So man, y'all were cooking. Woo! I used to have to drive that far. We lived in Panama City.
Lefty Lucy, how you doing? <clears throat> but when it comes down to it, no matter what, see, the thing is that, you know, uh, the thing is that, you know, a lot of times, you know, like I told, like what this whole conversation started from was these hearsays. Like, I, like you guys are here talking about the loopholes. Guys, don't y'all, they do exist. I I use them. They do exist, but you actually have to have be in position to be.